Welcome back to Philosophy of Mind. Recall the Turing thought that if you pass the, if a machine passes the Turing test, then that machine has proven that it can think. And Searle thinks that it can't, that passing the Turing test doesn't prove that a machine can think. Turing is an advocate of what Searle calls strong AI. And that's the claim that running the right program is sufficient to be a mind. So Turing thought if you pass the Turing test, you're running the right program, you're doing all the right inputs and outputs, you get a certain question in and you give the right answer out, that's all there is to being a mind, is processing these, this information in the appropriate sorts of ways. That's strong AI. And Searle is arguing against strong AI. He's not arguing against weak AI. Weak AI is the view that running the right program is a simulation of mental processes, but it's not itself mental processes. So, you know, we can use computers in all kinds of ways to maybe tell us things about how a mind might work, but it's not itself a mind on the weak AI view. And Searle has no problem with weak AI. We may be able to use computers and computational systems to learn various things about how minds work, um, but the strong AI claim is the one that he objects to. So running a program is not sufficient to be a mind. So that's his target in this article. And uh, the relation between his claims against strong AI and consciousness are a little difficult. They appear in particular in what Searle thinks is the relationship between having a mind and being conscious. We'll get to that towards the end. Uh, the larger claim is that computer programs are not minds and it's aimed at the computational theory of a mind. So if a computer doesn't have a mind then it's not conscious. Consciousness is part of what it is to be a mind. Um, and so what Searle's argument tackles is the very rock bottom view that a computational program could even be a mind of any kind and then whether it can be conscious is an extra sort of thing that we'll, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, so remember the argument number four, the objection number four, which is the argument from consciousness that a sonnet or a concert, concert emerges from emotions and only something with feelings can produce them uh, and computers um, don't produce them. The response on the part of the computationalist is that, well, consciousness could be tested. We could have a Turing test, and a Turing test could be something that would show that uh, the machine was conscious um, or that the machine could think. Um, so we'll be looking at Searle's Chinese room argument to uh, see how that relates to computers thinking and whether com there could be a Turing test that could show that a computer is conscious. So Searle's Chinese room argument uh, puts Searle inside of a room and he's given a rule book to translate Chinese. Uh, he, it doesn't translate the Chinese symbols into English symbols because then he would be able to understand what was coming in, but it simply gives him the, the Chinese symbols as input and says what Chinese symbols should be put as output in relation. So he's just translating from Chinese symbols to Chinese symbols based on a rule book, um, which is analogous to a computer program. And what Searle wants to say is that even if he could get really good at this and really fast and the rule book was really good and real and he could you know and and you could put those symbols in and he could spit them out as quick as any Chinese native speaker could take that input and write down the answer and give the output. Um, even if he got that good at it, he still doesn't understand Chinese. He's not a Chinese speaker and so he doesn't understand Chinese and so that means that the machine itself doesn't understand Chinese. And he claims that, that this thought experiment disproves two of the central claims of strong AI. The first claim that strong AI makes is that the program understands the stories. And Sora wants to say no. The program does not understand 
the stories any more than Searle understands the stories um, inside the Chinese room. And the second AI claim is that the program can explain cognition, and Searle says no. Uh, the pro the um, program does not explain cognition because there's no evidence of actual understanding and no evidence of computer understanding um, because there's no evidence of Searle understanding and he is inside the computer. Um, he is the one instantiating this program and he doesn't understand Chinese. So these are two of the strong AI claims that are disproven by this, the Chinese room argument. The um, distinction between real intentionality and as-if intentionality is what Searle uses to try to explain why it is that um, there's no thinking going on here. Intentionality is just another word for representation, mental representation. Um, so we've talked about representations already. A representation is something that stands for another thing that's about another thing. And the idea is that a representation, a brain representation, a, a, a neural um, uh, representation stands for something out there in the world. So it's the vehicle that has content of, of something else. Real intentionality, real representation, is inherent that the meaning is part of the system. And Sora wants to say that our system, a neural system, has real intentionality. When our brains are doing their jobs, they represent things in the world. So when I have a thought about a tree, I'm representing a tree. I have real intentionality. Whereas as if intentionality is derived from something that has real intentionality. So Searle argues that um, the meaning of a thermometer is only as if intentionality. So a thermometer represents the temperature in the room. Uh, so it's about the temperature. It's doing some representational work. Uh, but the thermostat itself does not understand the temperature. It, the meaning is derived. It's based on the manufacturer and the reader. So I understand what the temperature is by reading the thermometer. But the thermometer itself doesn't understand anything. The way it represents is by being designed by someone who does understand temperature uh, to convey the information that then someone else, like me, uh, can read and, and figure out what the temperature is. So the thermostat itself doesn't mean anything. It doesn't understand anything. Uh, it only represents, it only has intentionality in this derived sort of way. In response to Searle's argument that the Chinese room doesn't understand and therefore strong AI fails, various different AI researchers have issued different sorts of responses. So the replies that Searle goes through are replies that he's gotten from different AI researchers and then he responds to those. So you'll have a reply and then Searle's objection to that reply. So as we go through these different replies, think about are they strong? Are they good replies? Does this make it more likely that strong AI could be true um, or not? And, and how are Searle's objections to these replies? Are they sufficient? Does he answer the reply or, or not? Or is it, a, is it a weak answer to this various reply? So the first reply is the systems reply. And that is that the whole system understands Chinese. So it's not just Searle. Searle doesn't understand Chinese, but if you take Searle and the rule book and the inputs and outputs, the whole thing is what understands Chinese, according to the system's reply. Against this, Searle says, well, but he could memorize the rule book and he still wouldn't understand Chinese. So say he memorizes all the rules, so then he is the system. Um, he knows all the rules. Um, he's himself taking the inputs and processing the outputs. He is the entire system and he still wouldn't understand Chinese if all he knows is when you get this symbol, then output that symbol. The next reply is the robot reply. 
And this is the suggestion that we let the robot interact with the environment. Um, that you get the, you know, you program a robot and the robot then goes around in the world and interacts and that's going to be sufficient. Um, and that's related to the brain simulator reply, um, which is that the functional relations of the program could simulate the functional relations among neurons. So you get uh, a more full-bodied sort of uh, information processing system. So what these two sorts of replies are trying to do is trying to mirror the kinds of interactions that happen uh, with a person in, in interacting with the environment. And against these replies, Searle argues that they're not the right sort of causal relations. The robot is just adding on an intermediary, so you know, you put Searle in the robot and give him a, a view screen and give him some mechanical arms. He's still the system um, and he still doesn't understand Chinese. And likewise, um, a brain simulator is modeling the causal relations of the brain, but not actually instantiating the appropriate sorts of causal relations. And this is going to be a big question for Searle and for consciousness. What are the right causal relations? What is it that a brain does that's critical to being conscious or to being meaningful, um, as in the case of real intentionality, in the case of mental representation? What does it take? What is it for a brain to do that sort of work? What's going on? The next reply is the combination reply. So construct an interactive system that simulates brain processes, and you've got the system, the robot, and the simulation. Um, that you know you put this all together, and you'll have then all of the possible ways that a machine could be like a human. There's you know nothing that would be left out if you've got all of these different components as part of your system. Similarly, um, that relates to the other minds reply, which is any behavioral test that you could apply to a person, you could apply to uh, this combination, this, this robot with brain processes, appropriate brain processes, and, uh, um, and an appropriate system, right? So you take the system, the robot and the brain simulation and you put it all together and it's going to pass any kind of test that you would give to your neighbor to find out if your neighbor is a thinking thing. And in response to, uh, to these replies, Searle says, well, but we have good reason to believe that a computer is a simulation and we don't have good reason to believe that the guy next door is a simulation. You know, we know that other humans have evolved and have brains that are representing things and are conscious in just the way that we are. So we can relate our system to this other human system and to, you know, Searle thinks that dogs and cats are also conscious. Um, and we can look at connections between the way in which humans are conscious and the way in which dogs and cats are conscious and we can understand the reasons why those are conscious and, and, and therefore we have good reason to believe they're conscious. Whereas we have good reason to believe that the computer simulation is just a simulation and isn't conscious. And adding these other different aspects, even throwing them all together into a combination, is not giving us any more reason to believe that there's real intentionality, there's real representation going on, or real consciousness. That um, you still haven't gotten past the basic problem, according to Searle, which is all that the computational system is doing is manipulating symbols according to rules. And if, you're, if that's all you're doing, if that's what the computational system is doing, and that's what the strong AI claims, that manipulating symbols according to rules is sufficient to be a mind, then, you know, at, at base, you still haven't answered the problem at issue, that it's derived representation, it's not real intention, real representation, that the system itself 
isn't thinking. It's the person who made the program is the one who is thinking, and it's the people who are interpreting the program who are the ones that are thinking, who are having uh, real mental states. And his conclusion is that you can't get semantics out of syntax. Semantics is meaning, intentionality, content, and syntax is the rules, the order, the arrangement, the form. So what a computational program is, is a set of rules. You know, we saw the Turing machine. The Turing machine specifies a set of rules. You get an input, you do a certain kind of output. That is all a computational system is. It's the form, it's the syntax, it's these functional relations. You put something in, you get something out. And semantics is representation. It's meaning, it's intentionality, it's content. And you don't get that with just these formal systems. And so, according to Searle, there's no way that just strong AI, just setting up the right program, could ever yield a mind. That it's always going to be uh, an as-if derived form of intentionality. It's always going to be based on the programmer and never intrinsic to the system itself. That the system itself needs to be doing some representation. It needs to itself have its own content, its own meaning. And so then the question is, well, what grounds meaning? Where does meaning come from? And this is a really big issue in philosophy of mind that we're just, you know, kind of touching on here. Um, and and I encourage you to, uh, to think more about how meaning comes about. Where does meaning come from? How do we come to represent what it is that we represent? Um, how, do we, how do we think about things? Um, and uh, Searle argues that, uh, that the causal powers of the brain produce both consciousness and intentionality, um, produce both consciousness and meaning. And Searle thinks that consciousness and meaning go together, that you have consciousness first, the brain produces consciousness, and then by virtue of having experience, you automatically get intrinsic representation. You get standing for it. Your consciousness relates to the world and gives you uh, gives you that representational relationship by virtue of being conscious. Searle calls this view biological naturalism because your biology naturally endows you with consciousness and consciousness then is what it is to be a mind and to have mental states. Um, so this is Searle's view. Um, you know, think about whether uh, you know whether that makes sense to you. That consciousness is natural; it's basic um, and and necessary. Maybe there's some other way that you can account for how systems come to to represent to be able to have minds. Um, one of the things we've talked about is the power of the unconscious. It looks like the mind does process information unconsciously. And so one question for Searle is, what about unconscious mental states? Do you think that there are no unconscious mental states? Um, in which case, then you need to explain all of this stuff that looks like it's unconscious mental processing, um, some of the priming stuff that we talked about um, that, that happens, and other um, you know, distracted driving and these kinds of things, they look like unconscious mental processing. So one problem for Searle is to explain that kind of mentality. If consciousness is what determines, intentionality determines representation and mentality. Um, alternatively, you could think of some other way that we get representation, some other way that, um, that the mind is intrinsically representational in humans, and then the question would be, um, is there some way to give that kind of representation, to give intrinsic representational capacity to a machine in some way? Um, is, you know, is that possible? And you might think about the connectionist system. Um, is it more plausible to think that a connectionist system is representational because it interacts with the world, it simulates brain processes, so it's similar to the brain uh, simulation reply. But um, for the connectionist, it's not just that you're setting up the neurons in the way that a human 
neural net is set up. It's that the connectionist system is doing similar kinds of work to brain neurons in taking information in and learning about it based on feedback. Uh, so there might be a connectionist reply to some of uh, Searle's Chinese Room claims that the computationalist is not um, is not allowed to make. So you know, so think about these different ways of thinking about AI, connectionist and computational. Think about whether Searle's view applies to both of them equally. Um, can the connectionist reply in different sorts of ways than the computationalist can reply? Uh, and think about whether um, uh, you think consciousness is related to uh, to um, intentionality and representation in the way that Searle has suggested, or might there be a different sort of relationship? And then finally, think about the Lem story with Turrell and whether Turrell is a actual civilization or if it's just a program, a model of a civilization, and what the difference would make in terms of interpreting the story and interpreting whether Turrell has done something horrible or not. Um, is if you know if we're talking about an, an artificial uh, world like you know uh, an, an artificial program a virtual reality program um, then are we as worried about what Turrell has done as if Turrell has actually created a civilization and you know and how do we think about the difference how could we tell which one Turrell had done and think about that in relation to, uh, you know, to this combination reply about whether you have a robot and a system and brain processes. Um, would that then be um, an, an actual thinking being uh, by virtue of having all of those components? What would it take? What does Searle, what does Twirl, Twirl and Searle, what does Twirl have to do to make a civilization that would be worrisome? in the sense that is suggested in the story.